Well, hey guys, it's Flickers of Fear time. Time to do another movie review. So I feel like I've maybe covered, um, you know, a great deal of obviously American, British, uh, Italian, maybe some Asian, maybe some French horror movies, uh, you know, as on this series. But I have to say that one country's movies that I feel like I've mostly neglected up to this point is Spain. Now, Spain also had kind of something of a horror boom in the 1970s, like many other uh, countries did. Uh, and in fact, I believe their horror, bo horror boom was largely kicked off by this classic film that we're talking about today. So I figured it was time to like, you know, give Spain some love because they made some pretty Kraken horror movies as well. So 1972, uh, you had a movie called Tombs of the Blind Dead. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the Spanish title, uh, but the Spanish title roughly translated to The Night of Blind Terror. So this movie was directed by Armando de Osorio and was successful enough to pretty much almost immediately spawn three official sequels. Uh, you had Return of the Blind Dead uh, in... 1973, which I've also called Return of the Evil Dead. Uh, in 1974, you had one called The Ghost Galleon. And then in 1975, you had one called Night of the Seagulls. So those were like the official uh, sequels that were also directed by Amanda de Osorio. Then you also had kind of a handful of unofficial sequels and spinoffs and like other things that were like in universe. Uh, you had one called La Cruz del Diablo that came out in 1975. And then Jess Franco did Mansion of the Living Dead from 1982, which was sort of loosely based on the lore. Uh, more recently, actually, because this is kind of a cult classic, in 2009, there was actually like a really low budget shot on video a uh, movie that was called Graveyard of the Dead that was kind of like an unauthorized follow-up. And in 2021, there was actually two movies that came out that were based on the lore and like the monsters and stuff from the original movie. Uh, and this was Curse of the Blind Dead, which was directed by a guy named uh, Raffaele Riccio. And then there was Scream of the Blind Dead uh, that was directed by Chris Alexander. So it's pretty easy to see like how big of an impact this movie like tombs of the blind dead made like back in the 70s in spain and elsewhere and i feel like now it's probably not as well known it's obviously not very well known like to mainstream culture but you know horror aficionados you know hardcore horror aficionados and like like know it so it's kind of like a minor cult classic i would consider it another fun fact that i discovered <laughs> when i was researching this movie is that when the movie was released in its English language version, uh, and this is pretty hilarious, the distributors, I'm assuming, wanted to cash in on that sweet, sweet uh, Planet of the Apes money. So, cause that was very big at the time. So they basically re-edited Tombs of the Blind Dead to make it seem like it was happening after the apocalypse and explaining, I guess like via narration or like a voiceover or something, that the villains of the movie were actually intelligent apes who returned from the dead. So, uh, no, I'm not making that up. <laughs> Cause I read that, I'm like, you can't be serious. Um, yeah, but this was actually an idea that at least one person had and presumably had a bunch of other people go along with it, which is, you know, that's crazy to me. Uh, the edited version of the movie, by the way, uh, is titled Revenge from Planet Ape. So, no, it doesn't make sense to me either. And if you've actually seen this movie, I just can't imagine how it would be re-edited to seem like it was after the apocalypse, but whatever. <laughs> now, considering that this movie was made, I feel like right around the time when exploitation horror was just becoming like a big thing, um, and it clearly is targeting that audience somewhat, but I will say that the movie is actually surprisingly pretty light on gore and nudity and became even more light on gore and nudity. Like after some countries, pretty like the UK and stuff like that, trimmed out a couple of the, you know, I guess, quote unquote, objectionable scenes that it did have, you know, of which there weren't very many. Um, but the Tombs of the Blind Dead does have this really kind of more gothic hammer like atmosphere to it that kind of goes a long way toward making it memorable. And I have to say that the villains of the movie, which are, you know, a group of, I guess you call them revenants, like revenant Knights Templar, sort of, um, who kind of return from the dead each night to feed on the living and fuel their immortality. Uh, those villains are awesome. And I kind of feel like the look of them is probably the main reason to recommend this movie to somebody that hasn't seen it. Um, so the villains, they're not quite zombies, and I kind of feel like Amando de Osorio was like, you know, they're not zombies. It's not really the same thing. I mean, technically they are because they come back from the dead, but you know what I mean? They don't 
it's not really the same kind of zombie situation, I guess. And they also have like a like a vampire thing going on as well because they feed on blood, you know? And they kind of have some mummy style look. It's like a little bit in their look. So, I mean, whatever they are, like whatever you want to call them. Like I said, I kind of feel like they're revenants, but whatever. It's a distinction without a difference. But they're definitely like their own unique thing. You didn't really see a lot of stuff like this, like particularly in the 70s. Um, and they even ride horses, which I thought was kind of neat. Although, honestly, I have no idea where they keep getting the horses from, like, every night. Like, maybe they were buried with the horses, and the horses, I'm like, are the horses dead too? I think about this stuff way too much, clearly. Now, I have to say, though, that as rad as this movie is, overall, um, I found, I'd seen it before, you know, a long time ago, but then, like, I watched it again, like, more recently, because it's on Shudder. Um, I admit that I found it pretty slow at times. Uh, a lot of the character motivations as well, and kind of the plotting, are kind of muddled. Like, I think one of the biggest things that bothered me was that, like, certain backstories and character traits and stuff are introduced, but they don't really, like, factor into the story all that much going forward. You're like, well, what happened to that? Or what was that all about? You know what I mean? Um, but to be honest, like, the blind dead themselves are so cool and like so eerie looking that you can pretty much almost forgive like most of the movie's other shortcomings I feel like. So at the very beginning of the movie you have like this kind of ominous intro um, and it has like all of these shots of the ruins that are going to be like factoring into the story somewhat and there's like a really cool like very hammer like a very gothic score which was really cool but then after that we're kind of you know, there's kind of a neck breaking like edit to you kind of get thrown onto this pool deck in Lisbon, Portugal with all these vacationing people, um, which is kind of a weird like juxtaposition. So on this pool deck, we meet one of our main characters whose name is Betty. And she happens to, on this pool deck, run into her former, like her old best friend and former roommate, I guess, uh, whose name is Virginia. So Betty has actually recently moved to Lisbon and she owns a mannequin factory, which they took the pains to like bring up and stuff. And this, I'm like, ooh, that's kind of neat. And I wondered if that was gonna factor into the story, but it really doesn't. And I was kind of like, kind of disappointed. I was like, ooh, maybe it's gonna have like a little bit of a tourist trap, like kind of sub subplot to it, but it doesn't really factor in anything. Like, I don't know, it's just, that's one of the things that I'm talking about. It's just like so specific to say and you know take great pains to say that this character like owns a mannequin factory and then like don't do much of anything with that i think there's like one more scene like in the mannequin factory later on but it doesn't really you know the fact that it's a mannequin factory isn't like important to the plot or anything like that so that's the kind of thing that i'm talking about so anyway virginia is on vacation with her friend who i'm assuming is a friend with benefits they don't really say that but i was just like okay that's probably what i thought it was but uh his name's roger and Roger uh, very immediately takes a very obvious shine to Betty and invites her along on this excursion that they're going on the next day. Now, Virginia seems upset by this. And at first, I thought it was for the most obvious reason because she actually, even though she's like, oh, me and Roger are just friends or whatever, but I thought like she probably had more feelings for Roger than she was letting on. And so she was getting jealous that, you know, Roger was like suddenly fogging on Betty so hard. But you actually find out a bit later that it was actually Betty and Virginia who had a thing going on, like back in college. So Virginia is actually presumably jealous because she wants Betty all to herself, not so much because she gives a shit about Roger. So I thought that was kind of an interesting twist. So, I mean, this whole um, relationship that they had back in college, it's kind of illustrated by this very brief, like very, by today's standards, very, very tame uh, flashback of the two of them like kissing and sort of like making out like in their dorm room like many years before. But again, this is another thing that it seems like they went a long way towards saying, oh, they had a thing back in college and like, you know, they're in love or whatever, but it doesn't really factor into anything moving forward. So I don't really know why they took the trouble to, like if it wasn't gonna play into the plot further on. But like I said, that's another thing. It just seemed a little disjointed, but you know, I, I sound like I'm being like negative and I'm not, cause this is a cool movie, but I'm just saying that if I had been writing it, I probably would have made, if you're gonna introduce that, like, you know, factor into the story like a little bit later on, that's all I'm saying. So anyway, because, so they go on this excursion the next day and because obviously there's all this kind of simmering tension like between the three of them, um, you know, on this train journey to wherever the fuck is that they're going, I don't actually remember if they even said, but uh, so Virginia decides she is gonna nope out of the trip. Uh, she asks the train conductor if he'll stop and he's like, bitch, I can't stop. There's no station out here. I'm not stopping in the middle of nowhere. That's like not allowed. And so she decides while her two companions are not 
not looking, she basically just like hops the fuck off the train. She gets her shit and is like, yeah, I'm out. Hops off the train and heads what seems a little immature, but whatever. So she gets, gets like running off across this field um, toward what appears to be like an old village in the distance. Now, like I said, it isn't clear what she was planning on doing, what she got there, or how she was expecting that she was going to get home. But, you know, I mean, since her doing this is what gets her into the clutches of the blind dead, then we'll just roll with it. So the town that she finds out there, uh, we kind of discover later on is this sort of abandoned medieval village type thing uh, called Berzano. And it's right on the border between Spain and Portugal. So legend has it that the Knights Templar, or at least like a fictionalized version of the Knights Templar, they kind of like uh, stayed there back in like way back in the day. And they decided that they were going to start worshiping Satan and like sacrificing virgins in order to live forever, you know, as one does. Now, uh, you know, to this day, the locals claim the knights actually, like, return from their graves each night, I guess, like, in order to feast on the blood of, you know, whoever happens to be around, I guess, whoever's, like, wandering around. So uh, I'm actually not sure if the knights even bother to, like, roll out of their coffins if no one has been clueless enough to, like, wander into their little domain there on any particular night. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking not, like, why would they bother, but, you know, what really, what the fuck else have the dead got to do? So maybe they do. I don't know. So when Virginia gets to this place, uh, she pretty quickly twigs onto the fact that this place is, you know, empty of people, at least living people, anyway. And she just kind of wanders around the ruins for a while. And then, uh, for a pretty long while, not gonna lie. Um, and then she lights a fire and beds down for the night because she's got like all her camping shit. Now, no sooner has she fallen asleep, however, than the blind dead start, you know, just crawling out the ground and uh, moving in on her, you know, perhaps smelling some of that uh, virgin blood, except I, I don't think she's a virgin, you know what I mean? I'm just, <laughs> that's just my speculation on my part, but I'm just saying, I mean, she at least probably had sex with Betty, so. That's that's something right there. And that was another thing I wondered about, too. It's like, so the blind dead, like, crawl out the graves, and they're clearly, like, kind of knocking over the tombstones and, like, pushing aside the stuff. And I'm like, do they put all the shit back and, like, all the dirt back? Because it looks all... I don't know. It's supernatural. I'm worrying about it too much. The reason that the revenants are the blind dead is because way back in the day, they, you know, while they were doing all the Satanism and sacrificing tomfoolery that they were doing, um, they actually got caught by church authorities, you know, because you knew that was going to happen. And they not only got excommunicated, but they also all got hanged from trees and, you know, kind of left there, like, as a warning to others, I'm assuming. Uh, so crows pecked out their eyes. So now, like, their zombified versions have to hunt by sound because they don't have any eyes. So I thought that was, like, kind of a cool touch. So they all they just have these... Well, I mean, their faces are kind of skulls, so their eyes are kind of sockets anyway. But I'm just saying that that's why they can't see, even though they can get up and, like, walk around and stuff. So the next morning, uh, a very dead Virginia turns up in the field, which is adjoining Berzano. Like, there, it's, there's, like, a field, there's where the train track is, because that's where she jumped off. And then there's, like, this big, long field, and then, like, you can kind of see the Berzano in the distance. So, uh, so they find her body, the cops do, and she looks like she's been uh, pretty nibbled on, i uh, going to say. Now, before her death is public knowledge, though, like, before anybody knows about it, like, other than the cops, obviously... Roger and Betty actually go out to Berzano themselves to see if they can find Virginia because they know where she hopped off the train. They saw her running off into the distance. They said, well, they're presuming that's where she went. So they rent some horses and go out there. Now, during the course of their investigation where they're kind of like farting around and they find some, some of her stuff, like her bedroll and all that kind of stuff. So they're like, well, she was obviously here. Like, where the fuck did she go? But then they find out later from the cops that she was murdered. So during the course of their investigation, uh, they cross paths with this professor of some kind who tells them the legend about the blind dead, like all about the Knights Templar and all of that. And he also recommends to them that they go and visit his scumbag son, Pedro. Like, the professor's name is also Pedro, but I guess the, like, the son's name is Pedro, too. So Pedro, the son, is a smuggler in the area where the knights are supposedly active. Um, so they are, are going to go out there and see if he knows anything about it. Now, Pedro, as it happens is also under suspicion for murdering Virginia because, of course, the police don't believe that there's, like, these zombified Knights Templar, like, running around munching on the townsfolk, you know what I mean? So, uh, incidentally, too, this is another thing that I'm talking about where they introduce all of this stuff and then they don't really do much with it. There's this whole bizarre kind of subplot with Pedro and his wife, girlfriend, lover, whoever it is. Like, her name's Nina, I think. And so there's a whole weird thing going on with them 
And then the the weird thing going on with them, like sort of indirectly, leads to this scene, which is really quite unple- unpleasant, of Pedro raping Betty. Like that happens. So, you know. But again, like nothing really comes of that. Like it seems like a big, they spend a lot of time on it and then like it doesn't really factor into anything. I mean, other than Pedro like immediately getting attacked and killed like by the knights after that happens, like almost like he's getting comeuppance. But the thing is like the knights will just eat anybody that wanders by because they just want blood, right? So it's not so much that they were punishing him. So I just thought that was really weird that this character of Pedro was introduced in like all of, and he's like, he's like a scumbag and a rapist and stuff, but that doesn't really factor into anything too much. So that's another thing like where I'm, that I'm talking about, you know? So meanwhile, uh, Virginia's corpse actually gets up and starts killing people, uh, starting with her first victim being this weirdo morgue attendant who for some reason likes to torment little harmless frogs that are in this lab <laughs> for whatever reason. So, um, so yeah, so I guess much like vampirism, like I said, uh, whatever it was that brought the blind dead back from the, dead, you know, um, is contagious, like I said. So if they bite somebody and they die from it, then they'll get up and start walking around too. So I guess that's kind of like zombies also. So basically the rest of the movie is just like the knights riding around on their horses in, actually every time they show that, it's actually pretty cool because they do, it's completely silent, like there's no score and they do it in sort of like slow motion. So it looks like really, you know, epic and shit. And I think that they did a really good job. It's actually like really effective. Um, you know, so they do that and then like occasionally eat one of the characters, whoever it is. Um, there's also one other flashback scene in there where, uh, that shows the knights like when they were alive and they're sacrificing a woman by essentially like tying her to like a torture rack, you know, stripping her down to her undies and then riding their horses around her in a circle. Like they're inside, but they're riding their horses around her in a circle while taking slices out of her, like with their sword. So I guess it's kind of like a ritualistic sort of thing. Um, even though it's obviously the most inefficient <laughs> sacrifice ever. It's like, can't you just like take a knife and go dunk done? You know what I mean? But no, they have to like go around and take little slices out of her. So this is actually the only scene in the movie that has any significant gore in it because there's a couple of close-up shots of the swords kind of slicing into the woman's flesh, like her torso and her tit and stuff like that. But I mean, by modern standards, it's pretty much nothing. I mean, I don't even think I would be all that bothered about like a teenager, like a kid seeing it, you know what I mean? Because it's really not that big of a deal. So as I mentioned, Tombs of the Blind Dead, I kind of feel like it's really the atmosphere of it and the villains themselves that make this movie worthwhile because the villains look so, so cool, like the blind dead. They're one of the coolest looking like monsters, I feel like from that era. So I'm gonna say like, if you like Hammer movies, like that kind of style, and you kind of want to see something that's along similar lines as that, but maybe like with a more, I don't know, like continental flair, I guess, if you want to call it that, then this movie might be up your alley. Now, I'm going to say the runtime, it's not a long movie or anything like that, but it does seem like a little bit padded with, you know, characters sort of just like wandering around way more slowly and pointlessly than they need to. Like, you know, when when Virginia first comes across the ruins and is just like walking around looking at them like for a long time. So it's that kind of stuff you could tell where they were trying to make the movie longer. Um, and as I mentioned, there are like a few interesting details that might have made cool subplots had they been like explored a little bit more. Like as, like as such, like the mannequin factory thing, like the prior relationship between Betty and Virginia, um, Pedro being like this douchebag rapist that's never really gone into an 80 great degree and also whatever the deal was with that fucking morgue attendant because they did have a couple scenes with the morgue attendant where he's like poking at frogs and stuff i'm like what the dude what's that dude's deal you know what i mean like and then he immediately gets killed so it's just kind of like i kind of wish that more they had explored like those little interesting byways more you know what i mean if you know if they were going to go to the trouble that introduced it but you know on the whole um it's actually not hard to see why this movie became, like I said, kind of a minor cult classic and ended up inspiring essentially like an entire series of official films and a bunch of other media, like both official and not. Like I said, there's been a bunch of unofficial sequels or things that were in universe or using the same monsters. I think there have been a couple graphic novels too, like using the same monsters. Because like I said, you can see how that, I mean, it was original. They weren't quite vampires. They weren't quite mummies. They weren't quite zombies. Um, you know what I mean? But they had their own look to them. They kind of look like Grim Reapers, but kind of like all fucked up looking. So it was like a really cool lore and like mythology. So you can see why people like latched onto that and wanted to use it in their own work. 
Now, as I mentioned, I had seen this movie a long time ago. I think I might even have it on DVD somewhere, like in the pile or up in the attic or something, because I have like a bunch that I don't even know about that I don't even remember. But um, it's actually, as of this recording, which is May 2023, uh, at least in the United States, it's actually streaming on Shudder if you want to watch it. I don't remember if they have any of the sequels on there. I don't think I saw them, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't actually seen the sequels, I don't think. If I have, it's been so long that I don't remember them. But, uh, but yeah, so like I said, if you like anything like that, and if you like Spanish horror from this era, then, um, you know, by all means, give it a whirl if you haven't seen it, because it's actually, like, a pretty decent watch. So that will do it for this Flickers of Fear, and I'll see you guys again on the next one. Bye.